Well, good morning. My name is Hildebrand Pelzer III. Uh, for the past 26 years, I've been an educator in the Philadelphia area. I uh, served as a uh, teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, uh, assistant regional superintendent, uh, author of a book, worked at the university level uh, with inspiring principals. But over the years, my passion has been working with children and helping them become good, great, and excellent all at the same time, working with teachers and working with schools, particularly struggling schools, schools that uh, are having a hard time, challenging times, taking young people from below basic to basic to proficient. That is what I'm most excited about. Family of educators. Mom is a retired principal, father, retired counselor, both school district of Philadelphia, and my brother who lives out of state uh, is a university professor. Uh, but education has been a part of our lifeline as well as sports and athletics and just helping young people through day camps and camps. That's why I'm inspired to be here today. Uh, my mother years ago and her girlfriends operated a summer camp program and being exposed to the, to the opportunities that education can provide uh, has led me into this profession. But actually, I always thought I was going to be a coach athletic director or big-time sports general manager. It wasn't until uh, I worked inside of a juvenile correct correctional setting uh, years ago, late 80s, early 90s, that I was inspired to become a principal because I saw students who were incarcerated, uh, very strong, fierce, uh, powerful, outside of the classroom. But when I saw them in the classroom, they were very shy, meek, timid, uh, that is what inspired me to become a principal and I changed my vision from being involved in sports to being involved in running a school. Well, to be quite frank with you, uh, I wasn't a heavy reader. I wasn't a heavy reader nor a heavy writer. Um, however, I had this story that I wanted to tell. My educational experience started on a correctional end uh, at Cornwall Heights uh, between 89 and 94. And then that's what led me into changing my professional career path to wanting to run a school. And I went back to school for education and then moved into public education at Chester in the Chester School District and then the Philadelphia School District. Uh, but that experience early on and my experience for the school district operating the school inside the Philadelphia prison system, I wanted to tell a story about the failures of public education through the eyes of incarcerated students. That is the reason for the book. So I wasn't a heavy reader or a heavy writer or heavily influenced by uh, writers or, or, or authors, but I wanted to tell the story as an educator about what schools needed to do to create conditions to improve learning environments. And if you can com improve conditions for learning inside of a prison system, you can improve conditions inside of some of the most challenging schools, elementary, middle, or high school. So that was my passion behind the book, to talk about compassion, to talk about improving conditions, to talk about um, the importance of every child getting a quality education even if they're incarcerated, to talk about the importance of student-teacher relationships, to talk about the importance of curriculum. So those are the themes that are threaded throughout the book and those are the themes that I wanted to promote because those are the themes that help me uh, be a, a great school leader and lead schools that are, are, that are challenging. Um, let me backtrack just a second to answer that. The whole idea of communicating, the whole idea of getting young people interested in the importance of being able to communicate and convey their ideas and to, to speak, articulate, um, write, read well. As an author, any author that puts out books should try to convey that through their books, whether that's fiction or nonfiction. In my book and through my book, I hope to convey to other school leaders and teachers uh, how they could see education. I get more interest in the book from adults than younger uh, individuals. 
And so the adults that read my book or inform me that they read my book, I always ask them, what was it about my book that intrigued you? They say, oh, I enjoyed your book. I liked your book. It was a great book. What about it in intrigued you? Be but, and what they say is there's a storyline that I talk about that two twofold. One, how I traveled through education and my experiences through education, but also a solution about how educational problems can be tackled. So being able to communicate uh, is what has helped me. This book has helped me. But to your point about children and writers, children must always think about literacy. Children must always think about speaking. Children must always think about writing. And teachers must uh, develop the skills to teach our children, African American children in particular, but all children, how to communicate in reading and writing and speaking. That is so powerful. Now we put a lot of focus on literacy. We put a lot of focus on literacy. And we see some of these horror stories about our children not being able to read, uh, or not reading well, or not reading proficiently. And we have to tackle that issue. I was with a young man just the other day um, who I learn about children every day. My school was a school that was once low performing, and we're now on a trajectory upward uh, in just three years. But it's still a school with over a thousand students. And I always, every day, find students who struggle with any subject. And these are young people, kindergarten through fifth. And I found a young man just the other day who could not spell his last name. Who could not spell his last name. And, and I find children who, as they get older, uh, who cannot recite the alphabet. So there's a serious gap, there's a serious problem, um, and, and hence the book about the failures of public education. So this book that I wrote continues to inspire me about the work that I'm doing every day. And now when I visit classrooms, it's stories and themes from my book that I look for in the classrooms. Because uh, in my book, which was published in 2011, I talk about children, basic educational words like education spelled incorrectly or teacher spelled incorrectly or student spelled incorrectly, right? Because of phonics and things that, that they haven't been taught. So the book, I allow myself to use the book in a way that it helps me improve schools that I'm leading. So communication is the key, literacy is the key. When we talk about the achievement gap, what I'm speaking about and what you just spoke about, when we come across young people like that, it hurts us to see that. And it inspires us to want to do something about it. But it doesn't hurt a lot of people. And there lies the gap because that's that student-teacher relationship. It's like I cannot let you move forward not being able to spell your last name. Right. or spelling and we have when I talk about the failures of public education as a theme in the book we have principals school leaders teachers where seeing that may not hurt them it may not impact them and the children continue to go on as if they're successful and they're not and they become elementary middle high school incarcerated where illiteracy is, is very heavy in the incarcerated setting and that is a problem that we have to address and we have to address it through education. The um, book was published in 2011, it was actually self-published um, in 2011 and early on, 2011 to about 2013, um, a, a lot of great praise and, re and raves and reviews. Um, it's now 2016, people ask me when you're going to write another one. So time kind of passes by. But I've been able to speak to audiences it's locally. I spoke to an audience uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, Teach for America group. Uh, my wife and I have gone as far as, as London to speak about my book. Um, so the book 
attracts a lot of people who have an interest in the challenges with public education, correctional education, um, or just school transformation because the subtitle of the book is Organizing the School Inside a Prison. So the organizational dynamics that go into making certain the right teachers in the right classroom with the right children, the right environment, and the right setting, the right curriculum are all in place. So I have people who are interested in those things from teachers to um, correctional educators to superintendents and they call from time to time, whether that's through social media and other ways, about the book and about that interest. Um, but as I said earlier, it, it's time to write another book. It's time to even transform that topic um, and jump on other topics that also help improve education. Yeah, politics. I'm a proficient observer of politics, um, whether that's national or, or, or local. And I'm always looking at the politics around education, the politics around urban issues, uh, where Republican or Democrat, they are not talking about education, nor are they talking about higher education. I mean, fixing, improving, um, um, developing the future of education, you really don't hear those things. Or funding issues, where education is not funded, uh, education uh, is growing in different ways. So politics around education inspires me. Um, one other thing that inspires me as well is parental involvement. Uh, at my school we just recently opened up a family resource center and I think strategically helping parents be more involved in schools through the curriculum and the instructional program is the way to keep parents involved and be able to help their children at home. A lot of times and, and I see this in the feedback I have to give my teachers, is involvement is, is, is short-sighted, parental involvement. It's, it's really around behavior, or I sent home a, a daily report, or I called when uh, Hildebrand was not listening, and those type of things. And that doesn't really engage family. So um, I've talked to myself about more writings around how to help parents get involved. So politics and parental involvement, those are some issues that inspire me right now. You know, there's an elephant in the room, right? And that now, I've spoken on it in uh, small discussions or uh, small speaking settings, and it's, a, it's around the achievement gap and what's really happening in classrooms. I talked about any number of children uh, and, and, and my day job is I'm a principal. And you want to inspire people all the time. So you're inspiring parents, you're inspiring children, you're inspiring teachers, you're giving them feedback. But there is some very poor instructional delivery in a lot of classrooms, in a lot of schools. And although you, 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 you fix these problems and you professional give people professional development, there are individuals who should not be in this profession. And that's the elephant in the room. And as a principal, you don't go out and say, well, my teachers aren't great. And, and in fact, I had some rock star teachers. But universally, there's a reason why this young man I spoke about doesn't know his last name. Can't, can't spell his last name. He knows his last name, can't spell it. Or children in the third and fourth grade don't know the alphabet. Or a sore throat is sour throat. So it's because poor instructional delivery has been presented. And we tend to protect the institution by trying to market your school well or trying to, to, to keep people inspired and motivated when in fact they shouldn't be in front of children. So that is a topic that needs more conversation. It's the elephant in the room. It's when you talk 
about those topics it seems like you're talking negative about but the reality is in the data the reality is in the data when the data says that only 25 to 40 percent of the students can read and write and do math proficiently the data speaks for itself and there's a reason for that and it's not that it's just poor delivery but it may be folks not having the right skills or going back to the book not having that teacher student connection or as we were speaking earlier they don't feel bad when they see children falling down and not willing to help them up and at the end of the day you look around and most of your children are from the neighborhood as you spoke about the neighborhood you have children from the neighborhood and then everyone the all the adults have left the neighborhood so you know I don't leave my school building until about you know six o'clock five six o'clock sometimes later you know um, get there very early and I walk through the schoolyard and and I still see children playing you know they come back to the schoolyard and play or they in aftercare programs but most of the adults are gone and uh, that would be something to talk about When I first heard about it, and I've been following Dr. Steve Perry for a while, in fact, I have a quote from Dr. Steve Perry in my book. Um, my first reaction, and I think I said this to my wife, was I need to find me a Sean John or, or P. Diddy and, and someone who would be willing to, to fund schools um, and allow me to develop open implement the type of school that I think would be an excellent school. So I, I didn't feel bad about it one way or the other. I have read many articles, pros and cons about it, but me, in following Dr. Perry, in fact, he is one that speaks about that elephant in the room. Um, but he is also one who is challenging the status quo. And he is also one who is going into um, underserved neighborhoods and trying to get it done. So that's urban education. So when I read that, I said, I need me, maybe I need to call uh, P. Diddy up. Yep. I'll say it this way. The educational landscape now today is very different. It's about great schools. It's not just about your local school district. And local school districts, and I work for a local school district, they have to figure this out. People, communities, families, cities want great schools. So whether those schools are independent schools, school district schools, charter schools, uh, private schools, whatever the case is, anyone supporting great schools, that's a great thing. And we have to begin to look at the opportunities that that provides students in communities that do not have great schools. But I am a supporter of developing great schools. Well, about writing, have a story to tell, a message to share, so that no matter when that book is published, it'll live on forever because the message is so strong and so powerful. You talk about Langston Hughes inspiring other people and those types of things because their messages, their, their, their writings, their poems, and whatever they write about fiction and nonfiction is so lasting. So as a writer, you want things that are impactful and that will last. As an educator, um, and just everyone's an educator, and that's what I mean by the landscape changing. Parents are educators. Um, um, students that are, are, are performing well who help others are educators. So this notion of education is so important. This idea of getting education right is so important. Um, I'm a board member at for Mothers in Charge, uh, led by um, Dorothy Johnson Spike, and we just had a major fundraiser, and, and, and a lot of the mothers, their connection is violence, uh, children lost through homicide, and the question in the room over the presentation of awards was, how do you solve this problem of violence? 
And you solve this problem really, in my professional opinion, through education. Always reaching and teaching young people, reaching and teaching their parents, um, reaching and teaching and helping organizations uh, like Literacy University, making certain that education is connected in the community and not just in the school, but that the school becomes an outreach. The school helps everyone who is a potential educator and who is an educator do the right work around education. So the book is online uh, at barnesandnoble.com, uh, amazon.com, and outskirtspress.com. Uh, also through my website, you can get to those outlets, um, hp3-unlockingpotential.com. Um, I have a um, Facebook page, uh, a personal one and one for my book, um, Twitter. Uh, just just changed my username to HP3 at HP3 potential and um, booking uh, booking HP3 at gmail.com so any number of way I can be reached um, you can google my name it'll come up and, and information will come up that way so any number of way uh, I'm active on Twitter I'm active on Facebook I'm active on LinkedIn as well uh, so any opportunity, any chance that someone would want me to speak or uh, whether that's a small group or large group or with students or with teachers or with parents or whatever, I'm always available. Um, I don't turn down opportunities to share. Uh, I, I, I'm very appreciate, appreciative of, of anyone thinking that I have something to offer and whether it's small or large, whether it's London or a small setting, I'm there. And uh, that's what I do, and, and, and I thank you.